dedicated to all the people who made it. I can't wait to show it to you. I can't wait to show it to myself. I can't wait for us to see it. I guess I technically started this when I was around 16 or so. I don't remember a lot about those days, but I do remember that I started teaching myself how to record music on a semi-professional level pretty early on. It took me a few years, as it should have, but I don't think I was necessarily setting out to start a band back then, nor do I really believe uh, that I knew what I was doing at all. But through trial and error, I learned what I thought was enough about my gear to proceed with putting together about 20 demos, uh, all greatly inspired by a laundry list of bands that made me want to pick up instruments in the first place. Hold on a second, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Now, if you would be so kind as to indulge me for just a moment before we dive into our history lesson, I'd like to quickly thank slash preface everything you're about to see by mentioning these key musicians and visual influences, most of which I've been drawing from, in some cases, as far back as I have memories. Visually speaking, since age 13 or so, I've almost always been riding this weird line between Sub-Zero of Mortal Kombat 90s wrestling, fellows like Kane, The Undertaker, Sting. Then the likes of Michael Myers and supervillains such as Doctor Doom, Bane, or Deathstroke. I suppose if you throw all those guys in a blender, you get me. Or a mess. So, me. Now let's combine those visual influences with the fact that when it comes to music, I'm basically a child of Ozfest. I can't recall a single Louisiana or Florida event I didn't end up at. Even when I was way too young to be around such a setting, having grown up in New Orleans with the likes of I Hate God and Down. But I grew most attached to American Head Charge, Early Moto Grader, Andrew WK, Ghost Machine, Mushroom Head, Slipknot, Faith No More, Mudvayne, John Five as a guitarist in general, Nothing Face, Ramala, Tool, A Perfect Circle, and the guy I feel I've ripped off more times than I can count, the legendary Tim Scold. Alrighty then, let's get into the thick of it. It took three years of me tripping over my dick to get there, but the end result was a rather lengthy demo slash kinda sorta studio effort with some rather well-produced singles sprinkled in. It was called Truth and Denial. Not gonna lie, I think I did that because I wanted to rip off of Seether's Karma and Effect. Can't be too sure, but it wouldn't surprise me. Nonetheless, it fit the message, if you will. One that would prove to be a consistent theme in my music for the years to come. I'm referring to the cycle of grief and its general effect on the human mind, specifically mine. In retrospect, considering what came after this little batch of demos, I consider it a pretty weird introduction to the project, if you ask me. Uh, but to be fair, it was done and released almost purely for the sake of releasing something quote-unquote official, despite being super duper unfinished. I spent a great deal of my youth invested in the simple idea of Underline long before it even got this far, so getting things together naturally took ages, so much so that I almost settled on calling the project H7 as I couldn't seem to find anybody to write with in West Palm Beach, and sure, that sucked a big one, but I would quickly learn the benefits and pitfalls to working on something like this all on your own. I just made my way to the state after Hurricane Katrina beat the piss out of my hometown, so ultimately, having not really knowing anybody, having not the most outgoing of headspaces, that allowed for Underline to become my full-time outlet. Therapy, if you will. 
Over time and quite possibly desperation, I started teaching Ilian how to play guitar when we were both 18 or so. Uh, the project wasn't even called Underlined at this point. It was around Halloween of 2006 that the name was set in stone. The name Underlined came to me on an absolute whim, ripped right from a crossbreed song, bluntly, and to note, they were very, very much so one of those bands on that laundry list we mentioned a little bit before this. Despite the record still being in demo form, I figured a full-length demo would at least be a good start for whatever it was I was working towards. If it wasn't for guys like Ian Hall and Kem Sexton of Crossbreed, I don't think half of those songs would be as impactful as they ended up being. Our short time in the Candy Factory Studios genuinely helped shape the first well-polished version of this band. With the assistance of Vid, a multi-instrumentalist from Tampa, Kem and I were responsible for two studio singles, The Suffering and Cellar Door, quite possibly the band's most recognizable songs. Thanks to sites like MySpace, our punk asses eventually ended up selling just about over 5,000 self-pressed units of this weird little demo. And that was done with zero record label, zero PR, no distribution deals, nothing. Just me and a few pissed off guys at UPS. It was kind of beautiful. Then in early 2010, we wrapped up the promotional cycle of Truth and Denial with the release of Cellar Door. I then occupied my mind with the concept of a full-length studio record. Most of 2010 was spent selling our demos and cultivating an online fan base. I soon parted ways with Vid and moved my punk ass out of Tampa with the intention of completely reforming the band's overall sound and image once more, only now injecting a more obvious horror influence of sorts in hopes of evolving Underlined as naturally as possible. While feverishly working on what would become Dead Time Stories, we made moves to go live as this now reformed metal-based live act. This was when we moved Orias from the live keyboard's position to his final place as a guitarist. After performing a bunch of shows in South Florida, in late October of 2010, we lost our drummer, we brought in John Fecht, moved the lineup around a whole big bunch, and simply did our best to better our live performances despite an ever-fluctuating lineup. We quietly released various demos of the Dead Time Stories writing sessions and looked for ways to finalize the record despite having no management or really any core source of funding. When Merricks was brought in on guitar, the version of Underline most seen live from 2010 to 2011 was a variation of H7, Orias, Necro, John Fecht, and Merricks. Or some mishmash of the five of us. Still without a drummer, we played even more shows around South Florida, now with a refined blow out the PA and piss off the sound guy sort of approach. Go figure. We were also diving knee deep into pre-production recordings of Dead Time Stories. Soon after finishing our own version of the record, we gained the assistance of manager Tom Hazard, who presented us with the opportunity of a lifetime to showcase for standby records. The label ended up no-showing said showcase, yet we were still randomly signed, with the pressure on instantly, but in the best of ways. We were suddenly supposed to get our gear, jump on a Greyhound, and travel all the way up to Cleveland, Ohio for a month. It was time to record the record for the third time. We were literally knee-deep in living our dream, but with sort of blinders on and a mission overall to create the best fusion of industrial electronics and melodic death metal that we humanly could. Even if we were young as hell and kind of had zero idea what we were actually in for. To be fair, I still consider that little adventure of ours to be one of my most fond memories maybe ever. 
After one of the first struggles we encountered with our record label, we confirmed that not only Andals Herrick of Chimera was going to play drums on the record, but that Kem Sexton was going to be able to contribute electronics and backing vocals in person as well. Here's where the album kind of gets strange for me. Midway through tracking drums, I had what can only be described as a bit of a psychotic meltdown, thanks to some personal life nonsense, which uh, actually led to me rewriting the record's lyrics in about a week's time. Up until about a week ago, I kind of blocked out whatever lyrical content I had once word vomited over these tunes way back when. But I found this song by song breakdown of what each tune was inspired by at the time. Uh, reading it kind of wigged me out. So, because of how long it's been and how removed I am from all of this, uh, uh, while knowing that our fans have clearly picked up on the fact that a great deal of pain went into its creation, I'd like to uh, do my damnedest to recite the song-by-song -song breakdown of Dead Time Stories, which was written in 2012 and found on an old hard drive. Go figure. Anywho. If you're not super familiar with this record or its lyrical content, you may find the next four to five minutes a wee bit boring. So feel free to skip ahead if you're just waiting on the masterclass on what to avoid when being signed. When everything ends. I felt the ending monologue from American Psycho was a great representation of my state of mind at the time. My aforementioned freakout prompted me to rewrite most of these lyrics in just a few days, all newly targeted towards a very specific person, one who should probably remain nameless now that I think about it. The lyrical content is blunt enough, to be fair. The Suffering This is the only song that wasn't written with the rest of the record but we did feel it deserved to be a part of a major studio effort, especially if it's going to be our debut, and considering the song's history with the band, why not? Lyrically, it's based on the struggles of overcoming an addiction when you literally have nothing but your own self-destruction to turn to. It's about being at your lowest of lows. Simple as that. Wormwood Prophecies, a song about my end times, whatever that means, and paying for the wrongs I had done onto someone shortly before I was blackmailed into giving up a future with my son and his mother. Oh yeah, that was a thing. For whatever reason, it ends early and goes into the beginning of the next song. That may have been an early pre-production error, but I don't know if that's still a thing in the version that you can get uh, currently, if you look for it. I got Among Insects. This one is about the moment that I realized I had turned myself into something of a self-made monster, quote unquote, at least emotionally speaking, and I sure as fuck felt it externally. Personal Demons in the Void. This one was kind of childishly targeted towards ex-band members who used rather childish antics of their own to stab one another in the back. It was kind of the way of doing things in the South Florida scene. And uh, I wrote that song to kind of be a big middle finger towards it all. However, there are two different choruses. One's targeted towards some lady. The other's targeted towards what the actual song's about. It's a fucking mess, so yeah. Omnescence, a song written for the mother of my child, expressing sorrows for allowing various horrible events to affect her life and ultimately cost us a family. And yeah, wow, okay, holy shit. Forgot about that. Uh, so that's what that one was. Um, our redemption in your ruins. 
fresh off the emotions felt in omniscience, this is the bipolar emotional opposite. Once I discovered I was being cheated, uh, in more ways than one, all feelings of regret and sorrow quickly turned into disgust and hatred. Uh, but instead of turning on that individual, I turned on myself. Dead Time Stories of the Fallen Idol. A song targeted towards those who involve themselves uh, unneedingly in the lives of others, merely to distract themselves from their own problem. A Forsaken Act of Faith. This is a cover of Act of Faith by Ramallah, off of their Ice Screams release, Kill a Celebrity. It features Ian Hall, and it's a party. That's all I have for that one. Within Destruction We Rise. When I wrote this song, I set out to write the soundtrack to my own self-destruction. Nothing more, nothing less. Well then, that's bleak. Eh, let's brighten that one up a little bit. It has a lot to do with Mortal Kombat also, so I remember that much. The Downward Spiral of Animosity. This is a unique situation on the album where the song was written for a friend of mine uh, who had a rather traumatic youth. I imagined emotions she felt throughout her situations. Let's be vague here, because it's kind of heavy shit. And the song quickly formed itself thereafter. Alright, cool. Wow. I'm remembering things, folks. Salvation in the City of Angels. This was me documenting my failure to cope with the events that led to, quote, meltdown. In other words, it's me getting out everything I needed to before I attempted to end my life. That's deep. This one features Mark Nosler and Jameson Bowes, two very, very, very talented folks. So that's that. That would be the breakdown. Now let's carry on with the story. Thank you for indulging that, if you did. It was weird to read. Now, once we came back home to South Florida, we were lucky enough to lock in Skinny and Wayland of Mushroom Head's guest appearances on a song that would become something of a fan favorite, Personal Demons in the Void. Much time was also spent working with our drummer, Nivek. January through April, we were pretty much in a warehouse getting another lineup together for the stage, while Standby Records set the release date for Dead Time Stories for August 14th, 2012. Not to mention they finally announced our signing to the media, with a very weirdly worded press release claiming that even members of Marilyn Manson and American Head Charge were actually in the band. Now, we have no clue where that weird misinformation came from, but it was just another weird indication of the hellfire to come from working with Standby Records. Had only we done our research. Oh boy. If only. The label, very randomly, decided to pull the plug on our music video for The Suffering due to a budgeting conflict and the label's overall inability to communicate with us. We took it upon ourselves to shoot our own music video for Within Destruction We Rise, yet with the worst to come, any and all content from Dead Time Stories would end up being shelved. Despite the label putting the album up for pre-order via many digital music retailers, ultimately nothing was making sense. We were being told one thing and then being taken advantage of and swept under the rug the next second. Like so many bands before us, only we hadn't, again, done our research, so we had no idea what we were in for. In a nutshell, here's how everything fell to shit for those of you interested. Shortly before the release of Dead Time Stories, and after being signed for less than a year, Underlined and Standby Records severed ties in an extremely public fashion, where Standby Records made an onslaught of slanderous statements towards the band, our management, and me personally. The dude straight up claimed that we stole our music video budget, and that we were no longer on the label, out of nowhere. So our management responded to these random attacks with various proof email excerpts and all sorts of things that pretty much shut the label's allegations down immediately and helped put out the fire, so to speak. 
Soon after all this nonsense, we discovered that these attacks were nothing but a panic-fueled response to a massive amount of underlying fans that attacked the record label social media accounts. For what? For not allowing us to complete the record and later releasing an unmastered and heavily butchered edit of the material, as well as various other events like them pulling the plug on the band's first two contractually agreed upon music videos, as well as the overall lack of promotion put into the band. We were literally signed on a whim and then swept under the rug. Stand by, then stated publicly that the band had been dropped from their label roster. However, they made absolutely no contact with us, or our management, or really anybody, despite countless attempts made on our end. Meaning that said severing of ties was not done in a legal slash professional way, but merely in a I say it is so it is so fashion. Regardless. I kept moving forward, as I had for years, trying to get things done on our own, playing shows, remaining in the public eye, but band members started to drop like flies. And by early November, the only remaining members of the band were Merricks and myself, forcing me to go back to square one. I took the remaining two months of 2012 to gather myself and to prepare for yet another reboot of the band's sound, look, and overall entirety. The writing and recording of Alterism and End Then would soon begin. In the wake of our Dead Time Stories drama, the idea was to reboot the band from the ground up, as the only original piece of the puzzle was once again myself. Selling bootleg versions of Dead Time Stories to fund our further endeavors permitted our tried and true DIY approach to remain as alive as ever, especially as the exterior of Underlined began to look drastically different, and in just a matter of days too. To our fans in the blink of an eye, the mood had been shifted. We quickly did away with our traditional blue and black color scheme in favor of grayscales. Some people even took this to mean that the band was quote unquote done for good. Hell, even I did at times. Needless to say, shit got weird in 2013. So thanks to such weirdness, I sunk myself entirely into the production of an EP, taking three re-recorded songs off of Dead Time Stories as sort of an act of fan service, if you will, and pairing them with three brand new songs. My hope was to close the door on what once was and start something anew, sonically speaking and visually. I had finally found the quote-unquote sound I was looking for, and after all those years of fine-tuning, too, to think it only cost me my sanity and any shot of a personal life. LOL. And then would be released on Halloween of 2014, and to freakishly positive reviews as well. The single 831 became one of our highest performing tunes for the time that our music was on iTunes, not to mention, thanks to the power of social media, the band has since sold out of all three physical pressings, a total of 1,500 units. Pretty proud of that. While fans wanted to hear And Then live, our then-planned tour with Dawn of Ashes ended up falling apart due to a shady booking agent, so we redirected our energies towards And Then Live a recording of our pre-tour dress rehearsals released in both audio and video formats. It helped accomplish my goal of creating a live CD, just in a very unexpected fashion, typical of this project. Three men, 20,000 watts of PA, and all of the finely focused rage in the world. While all of this was going on, the next full length was already well over halfway done. Altruism approached. Altruism was the end result of nearly a decade's worth of work between John E. Stevens, the former guitarist and songwriter for the Ivan Moody-fronted project Ghost Machine, Merricks, now being the only remaining member of the band, and my lovely self. 
Musically, we three sought out to craft a very mechanical animals and Tim Scold inspired sound. That is, if mechanical animals was written on a boatload of heroin. Seriously, that was the approach that we took, sonically speaking. In other words, we just wanted an album that sounded that out of left field. We wanted to write the very last thing anyone would have expected from this band. And no, I shockingly didn't even have to dive into a heroin addiction or even try this shit to accomplish all of this madness, as events that would eventually unfold have since proven that I wouldn't have even needed the drugs to make such a fucked up sound. Quote unquote life would be doing plenty of old motherfucking to my sanity throughout the month spent writing and recording altruism, making it a natural breeze to produce something just that out there. Heard what I said? On this record, we would ultimately abandon the whole straight up death metal thing and lean more on the electronic side of our influences. As recording would progress on and on over the years, it became more and more apparent to me that Altruism could quite possibly be my last record. You see kids, good old H7 was diagnosed with lung cancer at the time of writing my third or fourth draft of the lyrics, so my punk ass went full bore crazy mode for a while there. Living to die, not taking great care of myself, you know, the works. All while lyrically confessing all of the things I felt I had yet to express through Underline's past music. Everything from a confession of the feels to my muse of ten years to a quote-unquote declaration of intent for my son to hopefully hear someday. Explaining why his dad is, um, the way he is. Funny enough, we structured the album to be like a film score, to sound like a movie soundtrack. That's why you can get the instrumental version on Bandcamp. Out of all of Underline's releases, up until that point, Altruism would become the band's first ever fully completed full-length record. Possibly the only ever. And that is a big deal to me, at least. We released this bad boy on Halloween of 2015, sticking true to the whole wannabe Michael Myers gimmick, and we have since sold out of all five pressings. It quickly became our highest selling record to date, pummeling and then and dead time stories, making truth and denial look like child's play. It even led to our first music video ever. How it took that long for such a visual band to have one music video? Don't ask me. I do not have the answer to that question. But anyway, all of this was setting the stage for either a gloriously explosive exit from the business, or the most finely crafted launch pad I've ever had in my entire career. Enough doom and gloom, age fugs. Sorry. Now, since you're hearing my voice, it's 2019 at the time of this recording, for fuck's sake, and I obviously didn't die, so that's how that story ended. The bottom line is, I found a reason to stick around. A reason to fight for my health, so to speak. Now, it's still a total shit show in that department, I won't lie, but I began creating music with people who inspired me to create Underlined in the first place that so-called muse, a bunch of my influences, and so on. Where that led to was my first ever solo release as H7, a full length of weirdo tunes titled Virtuosa. The most thorough way of summing up my experience as putting together this record would be to call the process eh, the most isolated I think I've experienced yet throughout my entire time of making music. This may be news to some of you, but Virtuosa does feature a fair amount of compositions done with John Stevens, and the whole record, lyrically speaking, takes place right where Altruism left off. I felt it was a real safe bet that I had a hell of a follow-up to the story, to what was supposed to be my quote-unquote last record record. It should be noted, mostly just so I can suck my own dick for a second or two, that I single-handedly perform guitar, bass, drums, keys, vocals, uh, all of it. Pretty much all of it. If it wasn't John's work, it was all me. 
I suppose that's what I mean when I called the process isolated. To call this album 100% the product of isolation would be a bit much, but most of the songs were written right after Alterism, so once they were all ready to go, the real questions started to pop up. Why not release this as Underlined? Why in the hell would I not? I've invested all this time, love, money, and sanity into Underlined, so what gives? Why release it as age 7, initially? Well, honestly, I thought it would be smarter to let a sleeping dog lie, so to speak. I figured maybe releasing an album through digital retailers only would be cool, modern, yada yada yada. Point is it backfired, and I had a boatload of reasons at the time, many of which I don't feel even half as passionate about today as I did in 2015, but that's all the more reason why it was later re-released as Underlined. Earlier this year, actually. 2019, for those keeping track. The album was pretty much the product of everything that came before it, and it's literally what happens when you strip down all the fancy shit and focus on guitar tracks, bass, drums, and vocals. So calling it H7 felt kind of appropriate at the time, as it was super stripped down and super personal. But I still get asked, will there be any more H7 records? The honest answer? I doubt it. What's the difference between Underlined and H7? Literally nothing. Not a thing. Nada. So hell yeah, kids. I hope that clears up the confusion that we left behind after dropping Virtuoso as zero promotion or physical formats. So, anyway. What happens next? Wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> 